on a special Thanksgiving edition of The World Over. What's the secret to dealing with hardship and the unpredictability of everyday life? Fox News host and chief legal correspondent Shannon Breen shares her life lessons and latest memoir, Finding the Bright Side. And later, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen will be beatified in December in his home diocese. I'll speak with Bishop Daniel Jenke of Peoria and the woman whose son received the miracle that led to Sheen's beatification. Bonnie Engstrom is here. Finally, she's half of a world-class comedy writing team, a busy mom, and a brain tumor survivor. Jeannie Gaffigan is here to talk about faith, family, and when life gives you pairs. The World Over begins right now. From Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. I want to wish a warm welcome and happy Thanksgiving to everyone here in the United States and the world over. Later, I'll tell you what I'm most grateful for this year. But Shannon Bream, Bishop Daniel Janke, Bonnie Engstrom, and Jeannie Gaffigan are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Let's get started. My first guest has been both a Miss America finalist and an attorney. She's currently the host of Fox News at Night and serves as the network's chief legal correspondent. Her journey from the law to journalism hasn't always been a smooth one. And not long ago, she suffered from an eye condition that pushed her to the brink of despair. She recently sat down with me to share how faith, family, and persistence have seen her through the toughest of times. She's the author of Finding the Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters. Here's my exclusive interview with Shannon Breen. Shannon, in the book you describe your poor mother as the meanest oh, yeah. mom in the world, mm -hmm. but she did keep you on the straight and narrow. And I want to share a line from the book and get your reaction. You say, my childhood is one that many people can't comprehend, especially in today's permissive society. But it made me exactly who I am. Mm -hmm. Curfews, rules, and embarrassing parental displays, they all kept me from making mistakes I couldn't undo. Mm -hmm. That's true. Why? Well, you know, my mom, literally, when I call her meanest mom in the world, she's not <laughs> insulted because she bought herself a plaque that she found at a yard sale that literally said meanest mom in the world, and she hung it up in the kitchen. And she was one of those moms who's like, I love you. I'm not your BFF. I'm oh. here to enforce rules and keep you mm -hmm. out of trouble. And, of course, our home was all about growing up in faith and trying to live a different life. I mean, not be like all the rest of the kids, you know. Yeah. If all your friends said they were jumping off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? <laughs> the typical conversations. But really when it came to, you know, my friends who would start getting into things like underage drinking and partying and all kinds of trouble, my parents really gave me a strong backbone mm -hmm. to say that, you know, peer pressure, I get it, but I kind of knew I was never really going to be one of the cool kids. Mm -hmm. But my parents really gave me an out because I could say, mm -hmm. oh, my parents are going to kill me. Are, they're awful. Blame it on them. And it really did keep me out of a lot of trouble in high school. And now you're a cool kid, Shannon. I don't know. Well, I've seen the dance <laughs> party on Friday. Anyways, right. I are. still think back about the Coke bottle glasses and the braces, and in my mind, I'm still there. <laughs> okay. I love the story about your mother. She taught at the school, Ugh. and she dresses up as Madonna Ugh. during... <laughs> Yes, 1980s no. Madonna, Explain, not, real, yeah, not the original current, Madonna. No, I would hope not. A lot of collagen <laughs> for that. Um, a lot of <laughs> injectables. There's a lot going on. Tell me why she dressed up yeah. as Madonna. You were mortified at the I time. I was. Um, Madonna had been on the cover of Time magazine and was this huge phenomenon in the 80s. And I said to my mom, like, wouldn't it be so cool to be Madonna for one day? Mm -hmm. Just thinking, I mean, it looks like her life is a lot of fun. And my mom was horrified because she was, <laughs> Madonna was everything my mom would totally was against. And so a couple of days later, I'm in class where my mom is a substitute teacher, and she shows up dressed as Madonna <laughs> and saying like and for sure and the whole Valley Girl thing, and I just wanted to die. But she, I think, was trying to embarrass me like she always was. But I think, too, she was sort of um, coming from the, the viewpoint, like, Maybe it's not cool to be a Madonna, but we're going to mm. take a day of embarrassing you in front of your high school friends, and we'll see. And you were raised in a religious family. Yep. I mean, and, and, and not only was it taught, but it was lived. Yeah. And I, I love that when you make the decision to go to college, you mm. go to Liberty University. Mm -hmm. Why Liberty? You know, my parents had instilled in me this idea of continuing in my faith. I knew mm -hmm. Liberty was one of those places after I visited where I would get a good academic background, but I would have teachers and fellow people on the dorm, roommates, 
that were coming from a spiritual place that wanted to continue to grow in their faith. And it was a real part of their life. This wasn't, at that point, um, I think to make a decision to go to a school like that, I mean, you really had to be committed in your faith. Mm. And not that we were all perfect Christians, we're flawed, we're learning, we're young. Um, but it seemed like a great place to go where I could have a lot of fun. And my parents basically said, if you're going away from home, it better be a Christian school. <laughs> There's a so. line that your mother imparted to you. And I, I want to use this because it runs through the book and this relationship with God is throughout, the, mm -hmm. throughout your life, and, and you see it at various stages, and we'll talk about it. But there's this line from Philippians, you quote, and you write, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Mm -hmm. You say that's hard to do, easy yeah. to say, hard to live. I think all of us come from a sinful nature and we have ego, especially those of us who are in this crazy business that we're I, in. Don't look at me that way. Not you. Together. You're the exception Thank to the you, rule. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> but some people in the business, not you. Um, it's hard because if you're in a medium or in a city like Washington, D.C., where there are a lot of big egos, you're around that kind of flavor and people telling you that you do a great job and you're mm. beautiful and you're funny and wonderful. And I think you just have to be realistic with yourself. I mean, because mm. to me, it's not about me. Um, I'm trying to live out God's purpose and what he has for me and everything to me pales in comparison to his glory and who he is. Yeah. And my mom was always big on that verse and saying, really look at helping other people, taking care of other people, worrying about their problems. And she lives that like nobody else I know. Now you're studying law. You're in the middle of your, your career at, at, at Liberty. And then you decide to go and compete in a beauty pageant. Oh yeah. Uh, not one, many beauty pageants. <laughs> yeah. Where did this come from? You know, I was one of those typical little girls with my mom and grandma. Every year we'd get around the TV and watch Miss America. Uh. And everybody seemed so glittery and polished. <laughs> and who doesn't love a sequin? You know, I, it looked very glamorous to me. And as a little kid, I would watch it, but never really think that could be me. Hmm. But then when I was in college, I saw a poster on campus uh. to come be in this local pageant, which would lead to Miss Virginia, which would lead to Miss America. And I thought, the first year I was too scared to even go to the meeting because I thought everyone's going to laugh. What are you doing here. Yeah. Um, but the second year I got up enough strength to go to the meeting and kind of hear what it was about. And there was all this great scholarship money, which I needed. Yeah. Um, and it, it looked like a really challenging, fun, crazy thing to do. And so I just dove in. And then you go back to school, you go back to Liberty, you date this guy, Sheldon, and then you find out he has a brain tumor. Yeah. Tell me about that. You describe it as one of the darkest periods of it your really life. It really was. I mean, you don't think when you're 24 and newly engaged and you have a whole life ahead of you, you're so mm. excited that you're gonna run into something like that, but life is unpredictable. And that's one of the things I really wanted to share in the book that we all, I know, go through dark times and unexpected, really things that feel like a punch in the gut and you don't know how you're gonna go on. Um, and he was having hearing problems and that kind of thing. Eventually they go through months of testing, finally figure out, we need to rule out this one thing. And then they come to us and say, it's a brain tumor. Oh. And um, it really just put our life on hold for a couple of years. And oh. it was um, one of those times where, I, I tell a story there too, Word starts to spread and people say, we'll put you on this prayer list and all mm -hmm. church will pray for you. And we got, in one particular rough day, we got a letter from a church in Alabama. I've never met these people. Mm. I didn't know them. And they said, you don't know us, but we heard about your story through such and so and such and so. So we put you on our prayer list and we're going to be praying for you. And it was that whole period of time was such an example of like the body of Christ. People mm. who, we don't have to know each other, but we're brothers and sisters and just lifting each other up. Mm. And it was a really long, tough recovery, um, but we learned a lot through it. Had to be terrifying. How did it change mm -hmm. you? How did it change your idea of relationships mm -hmm. and a person you love who mm -hmm. could be taken from you mm -hmm. at any moment, which is the reality of every moment? Yeah. I was really nervous to get married. Uh, my mm -hmm. parents' marriage did not last, and I was very gun-shy about getting married. I wanted to be a career woman and do my own mm -hmm. thing. Um, not that I didn't believe in love and family and that kind of thing, but I thought maybe it's not for me. And as much as I loved my husband, Sheldon, um, at the time my fiance and then dating, this whole thing woke me up because it, it made me mature very quickly and it made me realize the thought of not having him in my life, I couldn't see that. And I just wanted to commit to my life together with him as my partner. Now, you were studying law at the time. And then in the midst of this, you decide, I want to go back be a news person. <laughs> Where did this come from? Oh, I have always loved current events. I yeah. love the news. I, I, you know, talk about how when I was a kid, I would sneak down the hallway. My parents would stay up late on election nights watching, oh, you know, the returns coverage. coming in and I'd be sneaking behind the couch and wanting to see who was going to be the next president. My mm. parents would be like, go to bed. 
friend. <laughs> but I love that. I had such a curiosity about it. But when I was in school, my dad said, you're either going to law school or medical school. Pick one. He wanted his daughter to have every mm, advantage yeah. moving forward. So after I practiced law for a few years, I couldn't get that out of my system, this whole idea of getting into journalism and news. So I started at the very bottom rung, mm. um, making coffee and answering phones in the newsroom. And I immediately fell in love with it. Then you go to Fox News. You meet uh, Brit Hume, our pal mm -hmm. Brit Hume. Um, he refers you to Fox. Fast forward, you do write about Roger Ailes in the book. Mm -hmm, I do. Um, tell me the pros and cons of Roger Ailes, a, a man that we both know, yeah, knew. Yeah, a TV genius, mm -hmm. a communications genius. I mean, he worked on presidential campaigns. Yeah. He just had a real knack. Theater, I Irv mean, Griffin right. show. Yeah, I mean, I love impresario. that show. I used to watch with my grandmother. I me love too. that show. And I feel like he, he just was an, a master communicator, and he got what people click with on the screen. I mean, he just, mm -hmm. I think what you could argue he was better than anyone in being a, an engineer in cable news, pioneering all of these things. Yeah. Um, but for me, I mean, I also, and, and he was very charitable. We all know stories about people within the company who fell on hard times or health um, crises, and he never abandoned anyone, which mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. uh, that's an amazing thing. No, and he kept people he hired. He did. He knew from very the loyal. 60s. Yep. And some of them are yeah. still working at Fox. Very loyal. Now, for me, as with some other women at Fox, mm -hmm. there were uncomfortable situations and conversations mm. that I was in with Roger that put me in a bad place. I mean, I'd been a sexual harassment attorney, so I knew the whole landscape of, yeah. you know, how this would work. And I had a fear that if I went to anybody within the company, it would just go straight back to Roger because, you know, he was very mm -hmm. much the one running the company. And so I had to make a decision um, how I would deal with those conversations with mm. him and say, you know, am I going to laugh along, try, try to extricate myself from the situation? Mm -hmm. um, and I came to a point where I couldn't do that anymore yeah. uh, because it just became too uncomfortable for he me. He promised you a show at one time. And mm -hmm. you write that you felt that you were being asked to give up your own values mm -hmm. for some of the things he was asking yeah. you to do. Yeah, and some of those tough conversations, he would talk about sex appeal. Mm -hmm. He would often use more colorful language. Oh, well, yeah. And, and talk about how, um, you know, I needed to present a different image if mm -hmm. I really wanted people to connect with me, especially men and viewers that we wanted mm -hmm. to draw in. And um, he talked about different camera angles and highlighting parts of your body and things that to me as a journalist shouldn't have been my most important thing, mm -hmm. wardrobing and different things like that. And um, at that point that he had promised me, come talk to me about a show. I mean, I'd been at Fox for years and I thought, this is amazing. Is I went moment? to him, yeah. right, with my proposal. I had all written out ideas and graphs and charts and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, as soon as I got into that conversation with him, I was like, here's my charts. I want to walk you through this, my ideas. Yeah. And he immediately tossed it to the side and I began engaging in these conversations again. I thought to myself, mm -hmm. He didn't mean it, and and this is not a conversation I want to have anymore. And so I told myself when I left that day, I wasn't going to have these private meetings with him anymore, and I never did. I never mm. saw him again. And you sort of let go of that idea. I did, because I thought, yeah. you know what, if I have to sacrifice in a way, if that's what it takes to get to the next level, the Lord has this all mapped out. God has a plan, and I am perfectly happy where I am, and I have to trust that he's bigger than any of us or any plans, or anybody, yeah. any earthly plans. And so mm -hmm. I just had to let it go. Yeah, I know. Sometimes letting it go is the most powerful and important thing you can mm -hmm. do, which you did in that situation. Um, there was a, I read an interview with you. I can't remember if it was here. I, I have, believe it or not, a dossier oh, no. on Shannon Green. It's not from Interviews Russia, it? At, No, no. <laughs> the steel had nothing to do with it. No, uh, no, no, no British spies. But uh, in one of the interviews, they asked you, how do you, when you're, when you're in the intense glare of a breaking Supreme Court decision and you're on those steps and there are people yelling around you and you've got a producer in your ear and you go live, mm -hmm. how do you hold it all together? Mm -hmm. And in that interview you said, I think to myself, humbly, grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? I say that a lot of times as I look into the camera before we start the show or in a situation like that because I feel like Wherever you are, God has placed you there for a purpose, and you're not there without His hand, and He's watching over you. And I'm thankful to be doing something I love so much and to be in that mm -hmm. moment in the middle of history. But I think it sort of resets you and calms you a little bit, too, to say, you're in this moment for a reason. Um, you're equipped. You've learned things the hard way and the smart way, mm -hmm. but you've put all these things together to get you to this moment. So just do your job. Mm -hmm. I, I was shocked to learn until I read it years ago in one of those inserts in the paper, that you had this corneal 
difficulty mm -hmm. with your eyes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you first go to the doctor, he does, and when I read it, when my wife read it, she said, oh my gosh, this is just what she had thyroid cancer. Uh. And repeated visits, the doctor said, well, you know, you are getting a little older, and right. you, know, you slow down, and that's what happens to gals yeah. your age. Yeah, I, and it I turns basically... out she had well, she went to the female doctor, thyroid cancer, boom, she filled, figured it out in one time. Yeah. The doctor tells you, well, your eyes are getting drier, and right, this is right. what happens. Yeah, and that was the first doctor that I'd seen. He was the guy who did my contacts and glasses for mm -hmm. years. When I went back to him the second time, to his credit, he said, you have something more serious going on. He acknowledged that, and we need to get you to someone else, mm. to a specialist. But that second doctor that I went to, I went to him more than once, and as my condition was accelerating, what was happening, and I didn't know it at the time, but I was literally tearing my corneas oh my on goodness. almost a nightly basis. And it would, no one could explain at that time, but it was only happening once I fell asleep. Oh. So to be startled awake like that to the point where I would be sick to my stomach, the pain was so intense. Intense pain and double vision. So I, the couldn't, whole night yeah, so I couldn't sleep, which I was desperately exhausted. But now I had gotten to a situation where I was living in chronic pain. That made me very empathetic. That was the lesson from that. But that second doctor I went to, I went back to him and tried to explain how bad things had gotten. And he said to me, you're very emotional. And I thought, yeah, yeah I am. Because at that point, I was sort of falling apart. But that kept me from going to the doctor for months after that because I kind of had given up. And I just went to a very dark place where I felt like I didn't have any hope. Yeah. Surgery, then you had the surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it better now? Years Do you later. still suffer yes. from it? Yes, yes. Um, it's a genetic condition, so there's no real cure for it, mm -hmm. which is one of the tough things I discovered along the way. But there's a surgery that really gives you like 90, 95% improvement. And I put it off for years because there's a, a time of recovery. Um, but I have a great surgeon uh, in Washington who finally said to me, I think it's time. We need to get serious about this. Mm -hmm. And it's been a great improvement to my life. And really, you know, that was one of those things that, that my faith alone sustained. Me what that. would you tell people who are in similar straits, maybe not mm -hmm. a, a, a health malady, mm -hmm. but are in an emotional hole or in a relationship mm -hmm. difficulty, where they're trying to find that mm -hmm. bright side, where do they mm -hmm. go? I mean, for me, it has always been founded in my faith, because in the worst moment, when I finally found this great doctor, I was still living in enormous pain, I go to his office and he says to me, I know what you have, I have this moment of joy. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of the appointment, he said to me, "But well, you should know there's no cure. I could not get to my car fast enough. I felt like I had nothing left to live for. I could mm. not envision living anymore like this. I was so distraught. And um, I'm not someone who thinks I hear the voice of God, but there mm -hmm. was something in my spirit as I cried out to him and was praying that he said, um, I will be with you. Not I'm gonna heal you. You're never gonna have a pain again. Everything's mm -hmm. gonna be great. It was only those words, I will be with you. And it was all the comfort I needed in that moment to just keep going and to just trust him. Um, so for me, there's no deeper well to go to in times of trouble than my faith and God's promises. And they're all through scripture. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was just really the only thing that could be comforting in that moment. You're anchoring the show every night at Fox at 11 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. uh, you're still the Supreme Court yeah. correspondent for the network. So you're up at the crack of dawn when, those, when June rolls around mm -hmm. in May. If you couldn't do that any longer, hmm. what would you do? What would I, you like to do? I always used to say NASCAR driver. <laughs> because anyone who's driven with me knows that's actually true. Um, I don't know. I love to travel the world. I don't know how you make a living doing that, but I love to see other cultures and go different places. But there's this a part Fox of me. A Fox Nation travel show. A travel show. show. The two of us on the road. <laughs> oh, there I you mean, go. I mean, I'm just saying. Um, as long as we had a small band. Right, because along with they us. would be singing and dancing. Everybody <laughs> praying. Yeah, that's happening. Um, I don't know. I, there's also this part of me that dreams of moving to some great little southern town, not a big one, um, and opening like just a coffee shop and a bookstore. Wow. You just meet people and talk to people and have real time for relationships. And sign copies of <laughs> well, you Finding know. the Bright Side. <laughs> we will stock that. Yeah, the, 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 I'm telling we'll you, this will be one. a wall in the, in the Bream. You'll stop by. What do you by... call it? Bream Grinds or... I don't know. I had a friend who was going to open a religious bookstore at one point and said yeah. they wanted to name it Holy Grounds. Holy Grounds. It'd be a coffee yeah. shop and, and religious it. books. And I thought, yeah. oh, that was very cute. Yeah, so I can't cute. steal it. But Shannon Bree, thank you for being here. Thank as you always. for having me. I know it's going to be a big hit, Finding the Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters. Thank you for identifying what does. Finding the Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters by Shannon Bream is available at bookstores everywhere and online. And you can catch her every weeknight on Fox News at night at 11 p.m. Eastern.
As regular viewers know, we have been covering Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen's cause for sainthood for nearly two decades. In full disclosure, I was an original member of the foundation that moved his cause for canonization. After a lengthy court battle, the Archdiocese of New York finally released the late televangelist remains to his home diocese in Peoria this past summer. That allowed his cause for sainthood to proceed. Archbishop Sheen will be beatified on December 21st. I recently spoke to the Bishop of Peoria, Illinois, about Sheen's return home and how his cause would proceed. Here's my exclusive interview with Bishop Daniel Jenke. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. Very glad to be here. Now, Bishop Jenke, you opened Sheen's cause for canonization in 2002. What does it mean to you today that his remains are back in your diocese, back home, uh, and that we'll soon all see him beatified? It, it means a great blessing for not only for my diocese, but for the Universal Church. Uh, when when the, uh, the Sheen group came to see me, uh, I was enthusiastic from the moment they, they presented the possibility. Mm -hmm. And I brought it to our presbyteral council, and all of the priests were enthusiastic. So mm -hmm. I've been a part of this now. I'm in my 18th year as bishop, wow. and I think my meeting with the group was about six weeks after I was uh, installed That's as correct. Bishop of Peoria. So now, now, it's been a personal journey, but... B Bishop Jenke, explain to me and to the audience the background of why you and Peoria moved Sheen's cause and not New York. I remember this vividly because I was part of that group that initially went to Cardinal Egan in New York about the cause. And what happened there? Just explain it to people. Uh, as you probably know, uh, it was Cardinal Spellman who really picked Fulton Sheen out in many ways, both for his radio program before World War II and his, mm -hmm. his uh, TV show, the Emmy-winning Emmy uh, Life is Worth Living. But when he and the Cardinal had a falling out over money, mm. he became persona non grata. Yeah. And uh, the, the New York Archdiocese made it crystal clear they wanted nothing to do with uh, the cause. And mm -hmm. so did the Diocese of Rochester, and so did some others. Yeah. Uh, the Diocese of Peoria, on the other hand, was enthusiastic from the first moment. Yeah. Well, Cardinal Egan at the time, he, he said, I remember him telling some of the you know, leaders of the foundation, look, we already have Pierre Toussaint and uh, Dorothy Day. Those causes are going to move much quicker than Fulton Sheen. That'll be decades. So you can take that on to Peoria if you want. And then if they can get the ball rolling, we're happy to give the body to Peoria at a later date. There's a letter to that effect, which was written. Now, that never happened. In 2010, you paused this cause of, of, of uh, canonization for, for Sheen or beatification due to the disagreement with New York. Then in 2014, you suspended Sheen's cause on the ground that the Holy See expected the remains, Sheen's remains, to be in the Diocese of Peoria. New York fought that. Why were they so resistant to allowing the movement of the remains, even though Cardinal Egan had previously agreed to, to that transfer? I, I really can't answer that question. I, I'm not being coy. I really don't know the answer. Uh, I do know His Eminence, uh, Cardinal Dolan, has great personal devotion to Fulton Sheen. He does. I really don't know, uh, after the fact, why that happened. Hmm. Uh, I still don't. Uh, and I knew Cardinal Dolan when we were both happy priests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I don't know. I'm more interested, to be honest, in the future that we mm -hmm. uh, celebrate this moment for the church, yeah. that Fulton Sheen's enormous gifts, I think one of the greatest evangelizers yeah. from America, he, he and Billy Graham, I don't think there's anyone like them. Well, there's uh, a third, Mother Angelica. Always preaching I have the gospel. To, I have to slip oh, Mother Angelica goodness, yes. in. But, <laughs> but those are the three, they're the three titans of, of, of evangelization in the United States, certainly, over the media. My idea of an open-minded person is someone I agree with, and I agree with you. <laughs> so it, this is a moment of grace. And we've never needed uh, uh, good examples of relentlessly, in season and out of season, mm -hmm. announcing the good news that we need today. And Fulton Sheen was just out, along with Mother Angelica and along with Billy Graham, yeah. are outstanding examples mm -hmm. of that. Bishop Jenke, uh, in 2016, Joan Cunningham, Sheen's niece, 
petitioned the Supreme Court of New York to allow the transfer of the of the body. Now, I am putting up on the screen here, we've obtained some exclusive images of that transfer out of the crypt of St. Patrick's Cathedral and to your diocese there in St. Mary's in Peoria. Um, were you surprised about the refusal to transfer the body? I don't want to take you back, but uh, uh, th th there was a lot of confusion among the laity about why uh, the, 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 the canonization was being stalled, because the body had to be, it had to be moved to Peoria, which was the place that had advanced the cause. You're asking the wrong person to give this answer. Mm -hmm. And I am more interested in the future mm -hmm. than I am in the past. I cannot answer for other people. I, I do know and believe that His Eminence has great love and devotion for Fulton Sheen. But I, I, uh, I'd also would assert it was the Diocese of Peoria that took on the cause. Mm -hmm. uh, people, we did not, you'll, you'll read, we spent a million, we raised a million dollars, but right. the diocesan funds were about 30 grand. And mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the uh, historic case done by our Monsignor Sosman was, mm. I've heard in Rome, was one of the most brilliant they've ever seen. Mm. The clergy of this diocese, the religious and faithful, have been behind it to an amazing degree. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and I think it is only appropriate that his remains be venerated in the cathedral where he was ordained mm -hmm. and that the cause go forward. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the most important thing. We need Fulton Sheen who I, I devoutly think is uh, in the communion of saints, intercedes for the church, prays with us and for us. We need his example mm. as much as we've ever needed it. What do you consider the core of Sheen's charism as an intercessor? If you could define what he would be the patron of, what would that be? I think he would be the patron of evangelization. Mm -hmm. uh, way back when I was, a, when Paul VI was Pope, he, in one of his encyclicals, he, he taught us that the church exists to evangelize. It precedes mm -hmm. all the other mysteries and, and truths. Mm -hmm. And Sheen, I understand even as he was dying in the emergency room, he was evangelizing someone in one of those partitions uh, oh. next to him, as sick as he was. He oh. would he would preach the gospel to cab drivers. He had a great prison ministry with the rich and the famous and with the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. He did it all over the world. He, he was a true servant of Christ. Uh, the, uh, go, therefore, preach to all nations. And uh, Fulton Sheen did that. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. And he was so mm -hmm. deeply devoted to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, he was also uh, such in an... In season and out of season. He was such an amazing communicator, a man who could tell stories yes. with a particular end and, uh, and, and spin yarns. His, his great Irish heritage, uh, you know, uh, bled through oh. his work. He used all of that to evangelize and that, you know, dramatic actor's bearing that he had, uh, you know, on television for so many years. I see him, Bishop, as, as almost a, an intercessor and perhaps um, an emblem of the reform of the church and the priesthood during a very dark period. And perhaps that's what he could represent, if not be the patron of at this moment. I think that's a wonderful idea. As you well know, the overwhelming majority of our priests are selfless, holy, yep. generous, zealous human beings. And they need an example like him just for their own encouragement. He was a born preacher. He, he used his extraordinary brilliance, but he had the gift of bringing it down to ordinary people's level. Mm -hmm. He'd often in his preaching begin with two or three self-depreciatory notes about himself, something to make people kind of smile at him, mm -hmm. and then without noticing it, then he'd announce the good news. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was one of the most, he, he had one of the most advanced degrees offered in the world from Louvain. Mm -hmm. uh, he was brilliant. What did he write? Almost uh, close to a hundred books. He did. Uh, I, I've read, I can't say I've read all of them, but I've read a lot of them. Uh, and, uh, and I've listened, as I drive across the 26 counties of this, the Holy, the Holy Church of Peoria, I've listened to a lot of his preaching and teaching in, in the car. Yeah, no, he's, he's uh, extraordinary. And for those of you who have not heard Sheen, the, you really should. I mean, to hear him uh, and, and hear those, those, not only his preaching, but the television shows, they're, they're extra they really are extraordinary. Thank you so much, Bishop Jenke. <laughs> we will stay in touch with you in the days ahead.
God bless you, and I'm so thankful to so many others, including EWTN. Thank you, Bishop. In addition to Bishop Jenke, we also spoke to the recipient of the miracle that secured Archbishop Sheen's beatification. This mother's infant son was stillborn but survived due to what she believes was the intercession of the late Archbishop. Her family's story is nothing short of amazing. Here's Bonnie Angstrom. Bonnie, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. How did you first come across Archbishop Sheen? Where did you encounter him or hear of him? You know, in, in one way, I had always known who Fulton Sheen was because I'm from the Diocese of Peoria, as was he. Mm -hmm. And so I just had always heard his name. He was a local boy. But I really got to know him when I was pregnant with my third child. And I found him on YouTube. And I just started watching episodes of his old television show and listening to his preaching. Wow. Um, and, and what drew you to him? Why were you, why were you, you think, drawn to pray for him when you were pregnant with that third child? Well, my husband, Travis, and I, we both just felt that he was so funny, so smart, so warm. And I think, mm. again, we just connected with him as a Midwestern local boy. Mm. Um, so we knew that his cause was open for canonization, and we thought, well, wow, this would be amazing if, if our son was named after this, this man who's going to be a saint, this mm -hmm. man who's from our area. Um, and so we just started asking for his intercession even during that pregnancy and really getting to know him and befriend him. What, was it the EWTN YouTube um, uh, episodes of Life is Worth Living? Yes, that's what we watched. Wow. It was great. We still watch them as a family. Wow. Your son, James Fulton, was still born. He was not breathing, as I discussed earlier with the bishop, when he was born. You wrote a book about this um, called 61 Minutes to a Miracle. Take us back to that day. What was going on in your mind at that moment, and how did you ask Sheen to intercede then? You know, in those moments when, when James was placed in my arms and he was blue and not breathing and his, his arms and his legs dangled, um, my midwife immediately started CPR and, and my husband did an emergency baptism. And I think we just, all, I started going into a state of shock. Mm. But I remember in my head saying, Fulton Sheen, Fulton Sheen, Fulton Sheen. Mm. And I think it was because, you know, during my pregnancy, I had built this habit of calling on him for prayers. And so in that moment, I, it was like referring to your friends saying, I don't know what to do, but please fill this gap for me. Mm. And so that's what we did. Unbelievable. And then, of course, he, he began breathing. His heartbeat returned to normal. But it was 61 minutes where nothing happened. I mean, he was, he was not responding. Right. Mm. Right. First, um, we were at home, and then in the ambulance and in the emergency room, James had no pulse at all on the heart monitor. Wow. And so, you know, after 61 minutes, the doctors were ready to declare time of death. And as mm. soon as they took their hands off, um, his heart just started beating again. I mean, it, it really was amazing. And of, of course, they expected massive organ failure to right. follow. They believed that James would not make it because you can't go 61 minutes right. without a pulse and be okay. Well, I read um, that the doctors told you... But we just you, kept praying. I read that the doctors told you he wouldn't develop properly. He would likely be blind. He would not be able to walk or talk or feed himself. He's now eight years old. How's he doing? He's great. He's a normal eight-year-old boy. He, you know, rides his bike. He goes swimming at the pool this summer. Um, he loves Star Wars and hot dogs. I mean, he's just, he's a normal eight-year-old kid. I love it. Uh, in September of 2011, the Diocese of Peoria initiated an investigation into the events of James' recovery, your son's recovery. They heard testimony from family members, first responders, doctors, nurses, and others present at his birth. Each testified that there was no medical explanation for his recovery. Did you ever question that this miracle was because of the intercession of Archbishop Sheen? No, no. From, from the very beginning, we knew in our heart that, that Jesus Christ had performed a miracle and he had done so through the intercession of Fulton Sheen. Um, it, was, it was always a powerful, beautiful thing for us. And we, mm. we've always known that Fulton Sheen was by our side. Wow. This miracle was approved by the Pope uh, just last week on July 5th uh, for the beatification of Archbishop Sheen. What did you think when you heard that news, Bonnie? 
Um, <laughs> my mind was blown, <laughs> as they say. Uh, it was crazy. And I even said to James, you know, Pope Francis knows who you are. <laughs> um, it, it's a very amazing, surreal thing. It's super exciting. But it also kind of makes us feel really small, you know. Um, mm -hmm. We want all of the emphasis to be on God who performed this miracle. Um, we know it's for his honor and glory. And so, and we are so happy that Fulton Sheen is being brought to the attention of more and more people because he will lead them closer to Christ. And that's what we want. Now, in a recent interview with the Catholic Catholic Post, you said about the miracle, I really don't think it was given to us for us. I think it was given to the church for the church. What do you hope comes of this miracle? Right. Oh, goodness. Um, I hope that people are drawn closer to God. I hope that um, more people learn about Fulton Sheen. I hope that more people call on him for their for prayers. Mm -hmm. um, he has been such a powerful intercessor in our life. And I've heard of, of lots of people who have already started to call on him, especially for unborn or just born babies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I think that would be really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Just any kind of difficult situation to have Fulton Sheen really step in and, and help us to intercede. Um, but more than anything, I just hope that um, this really lifts the church, mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. American Catholic Church especially, in, in a time that has maybe been some struggles for us, right. have definitely been some struggles for us, and that it really, um, it's just a joyful time yeah. where God is, is just glorified. You know, that's what I really mm -hmm. hope more than anything. You all went to see um, yes. Archbishop Fulton Sheen's new tomb in uh, Peoria. What was that like for you to see this full circle? Because in many ways, it was the miracle that he provided to your son that brought him home. Right. You know, it was just, it was such a relief. Um, it was, I felt such peace and such comfort being with him when we were able to, to kneel and pray. And, um, you know, it just felt like I was able to visit a dear friend who I hadn't seen for for a very long time. Mm. Um, yeah, there was just, there's just, I mean, a lot of joy, but also a lot of peace. Wow. It yeah. was wonderful. You say you pray to Fulton Sheen now as much as you ever have. What do you pray for and what would you encourage others to pray to him for? Sure, I have asked Fulton Sheen to help me um, over the years and to this day, I still ask him to help me to um, know the Blessed Mother better. Fulton Sheen had a strong devotion to her uh, and to appreciate our Eucharistic Lord. Um, of course, Fulton Sheen made a daily holy hour. And so mm -hmm. that is something where he has really, um, you know, just increased my faith and my love and appreciation there. But then also just, I want his prayers for the rest of my life and for the rest of my son's life, mm. as I parent James Fulton, um, and as James goes out into the world, I, w I hope and pray that Fulton Sheen will stick close to my son, will lead him to be a man who loves his Catholic faith, who loves God, is a man of integrity. Um, that's probably my, my, um, my most fervent prayer. Mm. The things that Fulton Sheen and I discuss the most are parenting James Fulton. <laughs> so beautiful. What a great story. Uh, Bonnie, I have to tell you, I, uh, tears come to my eyes as I think about this because almost 20, more than 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, I was in New York. I'm not going to tell the whole story because it's too involved, but I made a deal with Fulton Sheen at the behest of a priest uh, because there was a girl I was dating whom was considering conversion to the church, but was unsure. And this priest advised, he gave me a set of Archbishop Fulton Sheen's cassette tapes for converts and said, go down to St. Patrick's and make a deal with Fulton Sheen. Now, I didn't really know who he was or where he was buried. I had a vague notion. I knew he was on TV, Uncle Fulty, many years ago, but hadn't watched him, hadn't read any of his works. So I went down to St. Pat's Cathedral, made a deal with him, and my deal was if he helped shape this girl's journey, I would do everything I could to get him back on television. A few years later, I came to EWTN, and we did a documentary on him, which led to Life is Worth Living, airing on EWTN after the world over for almost 10 years. And, uh, and the girl, by the oh, way, wow. is now my wife of 25 years, and she did come into the church. So th th there's a lot of interesting tangles here. This is why I also joined 
the foundation to move the cause 20 years ago, when, when they were still trying to get New York to take it up, and Bishop Janke in Peoria did so. So we will be in touch, Bonnie. Thank yes. you so oh, much for great. your story, for your faith, for your courage, and uh, what a great guest. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Archbishop Fulton Sheen's Beatification Mass will take place at 11 a.m. Eastern on Saturday, December 21st at St. Mary's Cathedral in Peoria, Illinois. You can get more information at CelebrateSheen.com. Finally tonight, she's a wife, a mother of five children, and in her spare time, she's half of one of the most successful comedy writing teams in the world with her husband, Jim. In 2017, she received news that changed her life forever. Doctors found a six-centimeter tumor on her brain stem. I spoke with her recently to discuss that shocking diagnosis, what got her through it, and her book about the experience, When Life Gives You Pears, The Healing Power of Family, Faith, and Funny People. Here's my interview with Jeannie Gaffer. So, Jeannie, how did you first become aware of what would end up being this pear-sized tumor in your brain? You take your children to a pediatric appointment, and what happens there? Well, basically, I take them all in at once because in my crazy schedule, it makes more sense to just do one visit with five appointments rather than five different visits. <laughs> so I've kind of over the years figured out a way to make this all work. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things I did. So, but as the children get bigger, it seems that the exam room would get smaller and smaller because they would just be so many children, me, the doctor, the children, all the school forms. And there was a lot of chaos going on, mm -hmm. but my, um, doctor, my family practitioner, who was seeing all my children, who also had an eye on me at the time, really should be, you know, canonized as a saint <laughs> in my book, because she looked through all this chaos and noticed that I was favoring my right ear. Mm. And she was like, what's wrong with your ear? And I said, oh, I just can't really hear out of it anymore. And mm. she was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, I just, you know, things go, you know, south, you get older, huh. you wear reading glasses, yeah. like ears go. She's like, no, ears don't go. Uh -huh. She's like, that's not a thing. Uh -huh. So she looked in my ear and she did not see anything, you know, visibly wrong, no swelling or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, she, you know, told me, I think that you need to like chill out a little bit with all this, like, excessive caregiving mm -hmm. and make yourself an appointment and here's a referral to an ENT and I want you to go follow up. When I followed up with him, I just said, you know, it didn't, I, to be honest with you, it didn't help at all. I mean, mm. there's a whole bunch of funny stories about how I cheated on the hearing test too, which is kind of funny <laughs> um, in the book. It's I all kind in the of book. make light of, I'm very like competitive when it comes to testing. And then I <laughs> kind of realized that I should have not tried so hard on the hearing test because I actually did have a problem. So um, anyway, he just recommended that in order to see the whole picture, he suggested an MRI. Mm -hmm. And so it was when I got the MRI that, you know, he called me uh, a few hours after the MRI and said, um, you don't need an ENT. You have a mass in your brain. And so I'm wow. going to refer you to um, a couple of neurosurgeons. Basically, this, what, how this kind of like ties in to um, my faith right away mm -hmm. is the timing. And so this was the weekend before Easter. Right, this is Holy Thursday. It has to be removed on Holy Thursday, this tumor. Well, this is, this is the timeline. The, the uh, MRI mm -hmm. that I went to was on Wednesday. Okay. I mean, on, on, uh, on Tuesday. Okay. See, I'm, I, I had a brain tumor. Forgive me, I can't remember <laughs> everything. So um, on Tuesday, I got the MRI. And on Wednesday, I was really, I call it limbo, that mm. I understood what limbo was like because I was just waiting to mm. find out yes or no, you know, mm. what is happening. Because I had no answers, I had no plan, I didn't know what mm. to do. I called like every prayer warrior I knew, <laughs> except my mom, because I didn't want to tell her yet. Uh -huh. And um, I also called like people I knew who were in science. Mm. Because when I was a little kid, my good friend John and I, who played on the playground together, mm. he and I have remained in contact over the years, and he grew up to become a neurologist. Mm. So I had a friend who I could call in Milwaukee wow. and say, 
um, hey, I am kind of in limbo right now because I was told I had a mass on my brain. I was given mm -hmm. some phone numbers of neurosurgeons and I can't get in to see them until May. They have my report. I don't understand what it means. I picked up my scan at the radiology center and I don't, um, I can't read it because my computer doesn't handle these kind of like <laughs> these complicated files. scans. How did, and how did so, you and Jim yeah. react when you first got the news, when you, when you first realized this is a mass on the back of my brainstem and they're telling me I need to get this removed pronto, within two days? Okay, so um, when John got the scan, he said, get yourself to the hospital right mm -hmm. away. And I would have never done that if I hadn't you know, had this friend mm -hmm. because I was waiting a month for the, but they, they didn't see the scan. So when Jim and I went to um, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital and got up to the chief of neurosurgery, which was like a miracle because um, I didn't even have an appointment and I, they didn't know my name. It was like, I talk about it in the book of, as if Moses parted the Red Sea for me and I just walked in because I was on my way to the emergency room mm -hmm. when a series of phone calls and many miracles brought me to this man who was going to save my life. Mm -hmm. And when he put the scan on the big screen and I saw that giant glob that mm -hmm. looked like a inverted pear stuck in my brain mm -hmm. that was literally cutting off the brain from the body. Wow. And it was like second, I mean, all those little nerves, I could see it. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it was in my brain. And Jim and I were like, Oh God, help us that this is happening right now. I, mm. I, can't, I couldn't believe it. It was like I was looking at somebody else's life. Yeah. And it was, that was Holy Thursday. Huh. So Good Friday was the day that I was going to be scanned all day. Mm. And so I called every like nun I knew and said, <laughs> please go to mass for, you know, go to, go to three o'clock um, service for me because I, I'm not going to be able to go. And that was like a kind of a big, that's a kind of a big day for us, you know. Right. Well, so, you write in the book, um, you should never underestimate the power of calling nuns, <laughs> right? I mean, they should get a fee, a consultation fee. <laughs> they really should. They're like, they will go to mass for you and they will do the rosary for you if you can't do it. Uh -huh. Like, the, like nuns are, like everyone should have a, a nun on speed dial. A dedicated nun. I agree. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> You write in the book that your Catholic faith, uh, and I know it's significant in your life, but that you grew up the oldest of nine in a Catholic household. Your mother was really the parent who made God very real to you. And you write this, if she wasn't dancing around the house to praise music, she was telling us the Lord is working or offer it up. God was a real character in our house. He lived there. He was always with us and always protecting us. How did that experience as a child draw you back to the Catholic faith? I know you stopped going to Mass for a period. And how did it sustain you through this ordeal? Um, just knowing that I wasn't alone. Mm. Just knowing that I was loved. Just knowing that um, there was a, a bigger picture, a bigger plan, um, that this was all part of a plan, and that um, suffering is necessary for joy. Mm. Yeah, and it is. Particularly, I mean, it's, it's the heart of the Catholic faith. It's really the heart of, of the, the big story. We all conform ourselves to one way or another. Now, after the Easter Vigil Mass in 2017, you received the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. What was that like for you? That had to be a bit, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's also a very heavy thing when you're about to go into surgery. Right. I mean, I think that that moment was really the sort of put your money where your mouth is moment mm. for me. Because we all sit there and we talk about, you know, our children to go to heaven and right. we're all going to heaven. And mm. we're, our job is to get our children to heaven and we're all going to heaven. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden when you get faced with like a, a situation where you might die, you're like, but not now. I don't want to yeah. go to heaven. I want to <laughs> stay here. I don't. And that's not really like, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you have to like really confront like, do I believe in heaven? Mm -hmm. Am I going to go to God for eternity? And am I ready to, you know, uh, uh, cleanse myself of all of my sins and say, for, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the 
uh, I'm at your mercy. Mm -hmm. I want, um, I believe in your mercy and your forgiveness and your love, and I believe in eternity. Mm -hmm. It's the moment that you have to put your money where your mouth is. Now, your surgery went really well, but after the surgery, a 10-hour surgery, you end up contracting double lung strep pneumonia, which scares me just to say it, which puts you in the ICU. You're hooked up to machines. You can't breathe on your own. You can't swallow. You can't talk. And you are furious, according to the book. What did you learn about yourself in the ICU? You know, I had to, like, face this part of myself that wanted to control everything and I was Mm. unable to control anything and it really I mean you know I joke about this but people like literally leave their life and leave all their possessions and leave their families and leave the comforts and go and go into a monastery to be with God Mm. and I got forced there because I didn't I didn't make that choice. It it happened. Mm -hmm. And so when I went in to that ICU and I couldn't, I was fasting and I was fasting from noise and the phone Mm. and the kids and the husband and, and, and human contact and, and uh, human love. It was just me who I, you know, was kind of a hideous monster without God and Mm. God who gave me hope, light, and love and Mm. pulled me out of that of that darkness that I Mm. went to when I was just faced with myself. Wow. You write that God spoke to you. He gave you additional commandments indeed while you were in the hospital such as tell Jim and the children you love them every day. Two, admit you were wrong. Three, take time to give each your undivided attention and others. People have to buy the book to get the rest. Why did you think God gave you these personal commandments? Yes, and and also, like, I don't want to have delusions of grandeur like he actually gave me commandments. But they were like concierge commandments, and I think God is giving us all, you know, personal, (laughs) personal commandments that we just don't listen to because we're so distracted Mm. by life. And we can be like, you know, I have to get to, even if you're like a holy roller, and you're like, I'm going to go to Mass in time, and all my kids are going to sit in the front row, and they're going to look great, and they're going to do their rosary, and they're going to and you're checking off a tick list, you're not really experiencing, you know, the the beauty of life that, that God has given you and experiencing mm-hmm. those little moments of gratitude for even the bad things, you know, and 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 not and and, and missing out on the big picture. So the commandments that God gave to me, which I, you know, um in I try to be in a humorous way because I'm talking yeah. about something really heavy. Yeah. So, you know, you need a little comic relief from this story because the story is really heavy. And it's, but it's a really and, funny book. You do find you find the light side around the edges of these dark moments that, that sooner or later, you write about this in the book, sooner or later we all are going to find, I mean, unless you're some extraordinary superhuman person, you're going to find yourself in a, in a medical emergency or a medical crisis with someone around you or your own. And in this book, your husband, and in, in, in your life, Jim becomes your main caretaker. And you write that his humor was so important to your getting better. He's doing characters while he's washing your hair. He even created that YouTube show <laughs> called Feeding Frenzy. Tell us why he created that. So the thing is, is that he it wasn't really in his wheelhouse to be a caregiver, even though he became a caregiver and mm-hmm. he did learn some nursing and he learned some kid you know, care and he learned a lot of things. But what is in his wheelhouse is to be the, the funniest guy in the world. Mm-hmm. And so when I went down to the dumps, which I did, because I'm not going to say that after God gave me the commandments, and I, I actually do point this out in the book, mm-hmm. it took me a while to listen to those commandments. Right. I was very upset about, you know, not being able to get up and take care of myself and like even, you know, walk to the bathroom or wash my hair or, mm-hmm. or and when I was eating, um, even after I got off the machine, the fact that that eating for me was getting formula like pumped through a tube in my stomach. Right, you had a feeding it tube. Was, it was, I had a feeding tube. I had two different kinds of feeding tubes, mm. but I had one that was coming out of my stomach because that's how I got out of the hospital. Mm. Um, but once that machine was detached from me and I was able to like, you know, use a syringe to use the peg tube to, to have like formula at different, like three or four times a day, Mm. and Jim had to do it. Mm. Um, 
I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I, I thought it was disgusting. And I was, I was sad that I couldn't eat. So anyway, Jim, um, to cheer me up, he invented this like crazy cooking show <laughs> and he put it on YouTube. He's like, we're gonna make a cooking show about how I can inject the formula and to make a romantic dinner, you can light a candle. But <laughs> the thing was, I kind of went along with it because it was so funny. And then we received this amazing outpouring of, of gratitude mm. from like the food tube community, which until that point I didn't even know existed. Mm. Um, where they were like, thank you for normalizing this way that we have to live. Mm. Like there are people that can't use their- Can't digest you know, food, yeah, they have to yeah. have it. Yeah, it they it, they it, have to go right in the stomach, they mm, can't mm. ingest it. The, the, and it's like all of a sudden like the, the world just opened up to me. So mm. one of the things that came out of this whole thing was me having a, a huge, huge feeling of gratitude Hmm. for my brain tumor. Wow. Like, it was like the best thing that ever happened to me. Hmm. This, this is a very personal book. It's really also about your relationship, your family, how that has deepened. Now, you and Jim have written seven comedy specials together. Uh, you directed many of those specials, including the TV show, which you were writing and directing. Uh, how do you work together? When do you find time to do that, Jean? Well, I think that's why Jim and I kind of wound up together. I mean, besides, even though I believe that God designed our marriage mm -hmm. for this moment in time, mm -hmm. for the time when I almost died and I needed someone like Jim to pull me out and I and my kids and it's all part of this grand design. But I think that one of the reasons that we wound up together is because we both love to work. Mm -hmm. We love to produce. And we're very blessed and lucky that we were able to make a living and have success at um, our creative uh, uh, you know, gifts that we were able to write together and work together and produce together. Mm -hmm. And so that it's not like, how do you do it? It's like, that's why we do it. It's because we um, love each other and we love the work. Yeah. Before I let you go, this is the first book where I've ever seen anyone in their acknowledgments thank a tumor. Why do you thank the tumor for coming into your life? Well, I think that if I, if this hadn't happened, I would have just probably not um, been able to see the work of God in my life as strongly and clearly. Mm. And um, but I, I've always been vocal about my faith. Like, I don't care if I'm, you know, I'm in a very secular business in a very secular city. And I've never been like really ashamed to be like, um, Hey, all I'm the Jesus freak in the room, okay? <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, like now, it's like, but and here is why, mm. you know. And he, I feel like I'm, I am able to witness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that I can um, articulate better about how I can use my talents that are inherently given to me by God to build His kingdom. Well, Jeannie, I can't think of a better place to end it than there. I wish we could go on. The, thank you so much for being with us and for your candor and for the very funny and moving book, When Life Gives You Pairs, The Healing Power of Family, Faith, and Funny People by Jeannie Gaffigan, available at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you again. Great job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we go, I want to thank all of you for your devotion to this show for the past 23 years. I can't believe it's been that long. Though we occasionally take lumps for doing so, we do this show each week for you and with you always in our minds and hearts. And we're very grateful that you're there week after week. I'm also thankful to my producers, Christina Califf, Elena Isela, and Christopher Edwards, without whom I could not do this work each week. I'm also grateful to the crew that you don't see, Michael Bogaski, our director, Jonathan Watley, and Andy Spangenberg, our editors, Chris Cardno, our operations manager, Jay Chipik, our engineer, Victoria Stiles, our makeup artist, and countless others. I'm particularly thankful to my family, especially my wife, Rebecca, whom for 25 amazing years and three children have put up with me. I'm so blessed to be able to get together with my mom and dad and brother and the whole family this week. 
and I hope you will as well. We're particularly praying for those men and women in the armed services away from their loved ones and those less fortunate who are alone this time of year. Reach out to them this Thanksgiving and into the Advent season. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. May God bless you. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, I'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.